Hi, I'm Dr. Gemma, and welcome back to Cognitive, the Knitting Psychology Podcast. Cheerfully and somewhat irregularly in business since 2008. Segments today may include what's on my hooks, needles, and spindles, a strategy, something I really like, put a lid on it, oh shoot, and blather. So sit back, put your feet up, pick up your knitting, crocheting, spinning, weaving, or dyeing, (laughs) or any other yarny thing you're doing, and get ready to enjoy. Well, hi everybody, it's Gemma, and welcome back to Cognitive. This is episode 126, and I think we all can nod in agreement when I say it is called a taxing week. (laughs) Your comments are very welcome. Please feel free to comment on the blog at cognitivepodcast.blogspot.com or over on our group on Ravelry. I deeply appreciate the comments. We had some active discussion going on this week over at Ravelry. And I want to thank everybody again for the condolences for our own blankets. And I also want to extend our heartfelt condolences to Sage Pekas, who lost two major members of her family this week in the form of her two very well-loved and long-lived cat people. And Sage Pekas was asking that I do a strategy about mourning for pets, which I think is one of the most appropriate things I can do. So I think I'm going to stick that in in this episode. It may sound a little fast and a little cut and dried, but you probably know a lot about this once you give yourself permission to think about it. In the meantime, warm thanks to Sustainable Living, who for some reason finds my voice calming. And she is the second person to tell me that she's using the podcast to fall asleep at night. Huh. (laughs) You never know as a podcaster quite how to interpret that one. (laughs) I will take it as a mark of trust. She also mentioned surprise that I was attacked while running. I've been running since I was 10 years old. And I have to tell you, I have been attacked many times, mostly in California, that when I was running at Stanford, I used to run the dish and people were frequently attacked up there. And of course, I learned that the big thing you do is run a hill. If somebody's attacking you, you can't outrun them, run a hill. The strategy has served me various times. And this is why I tell the tales of my dogs defending me with such love, because it is kind of creepy. And I've even been attacked in my neighborhood here, which I find weird because we're on farms, five acre farms in the middle of nowhere. If anybody's counting, I've also been hit by cars twice when the driver was looking directly at me and you would see them sort of daring me, even though I was in the intersection and had a limit because of the lights, but still I've been hit by cars. Fortunately, I have just bounced. Uh, But I have to tell you that what this really means is if you're a woman and you run alone, you face a lot of challenges. And before anybody says it, my joke about my running is that I run like a nun, which is to say I wear a lot of clothing. I am not out there half naked. But, you know, when you even make that comment, you have to realize how incredibly misogynist that is. The reality is we don't attack people. A woman running in very skimpy clothes, a woman running in a dress. We don't attack people. We don't attack men or boys or kids who are smaller than us. We don't attack people. The law says we don't, and so does human decency. It does not matter what the person running is dressed like. I have to also say this leads me to talk about very briefly the idea that a victim somehow is bringing it on. Let's be honest, these attacks have been sexual in nature, which I find really strange because I've never considered myself particularly beautiful or shapely. And that in itself tells you what I'm about to say. It's not about the victim. It's about the abuser sense that they have no power and they're looking for someone whom they perceive as more helpless than them to exercise power on. And this comes in the form of sexual assault But it also comes in the form of racism and attacks 
based on somebody being different and the attacker's need to feel superior somehow. So yes, when you're running alone as a woman, I strongly suggest you carry an armed and loaded German Shepherd. Thank you, Sustainable Living, for giving me the chance to voice that. Meanwhile, our buddy Sal Pal, I got one thing to say to you, my friend. Do the Franken socks. They're a lot of fun. And they go through your stash and they're free socks. I mean, you're just using what you have left over and getting more use. So why wouldn't you do them? And they're just fun. I never know what they're going to turn out like. I never have planned them. I just kind of throw them together. The most I will do is I avoid putting two colorways in the stripes side by side if they are too close in value or color. So I do try to get some contrast. Knit One Pub 2 reports that she uses baby signing, as she calls it, with her family, even to this day, even as they've grown up. For example, they'll use the signs for more and all done, when if they said these things aloud in a group of hearing people, it might insult, for example, the host of the party. So in other words, if you want to signal that you want to go home, you can use the all done sign without the host of the party understanding what you're doing. And many hearing people do this. They have a smattering of ASL and they will use the signs they remember this way. I find it incredibly helpful. I also have to say I kind of push that one a little further. When I'm in staff meetings, I will repeat my answers in signs sometimes as I'm saying them because I want the other people in the staff to realize that I'm using sign and I want them to get comfortable with seeing sign. And I'm only using very simple statements like done or yes or no. It's a useful thing. The other thing is a lot of us are going to become hard of hearing as we age. I am not particularly having that problem that I know of. I'm a little bit, I think, but I wouldn't even say it's far enough to call it hard of hearing. I just miss occasional things in a crowd. So sign language is going to be universally useful. Meanwhile, the astonishing Chris Ah reports that she is aware that yarning is a synonym for storytelling and it is a vital part of the practice of the indigenous people of Australia as a means of transmitting their culture. Yes, there's an interesting thing in the background there. I'm sure the indigenous people of Australia are not speaking English or were not speaking English originally, but they've picked up yarning for storytelling. In modern English, that's somewhat archaic to use the word yarn for a story. However, it should be pointed out if you pay attention to language, there is an enormous amount of fiber production terminology present in our language. And it's because fiber production and the making of clothing has been so culturally vital for everybody, no matter where we come from. Humans almost always have to cover themselves with clothing as a protection against the environment. So the language of fiber, of knitting and spinning and weaving is very big and very present still in our language. We often don't really understand it when we are using it. So we use the word warped quite often and we use things like yarning or a sailor's crazy yarn, that sort of thing. So thank you, Chris Ah. Meanwhile, Chris Ah. Schnoodle that baby for all of us. So at this point you might be saying, hey Gems, what's on your hooks and needles? Well, first of all, in the finished category, nothing really, but I finished the first of the Spring is Coming socks. It is beautiful. It is a beautiful, beautiful colorway. So as you can guess, the second sock is well on its way. I believe I'm past the waist yarn now and I'm on the foot of it. I was really cranking on it this week. Every time I got bored I would pick it up and put in a few rows. So that's nice. I am well on my way to having those socks finished. In the meantime, the I Need Me Some Stripes socks, I now have both of them on to the foot. They are both past the waist yarn for the heel. Wait till you see the yarn I have in mind for the heel. Oh! hot potato. It is really a scorcher of a colorway. It's in reds. But I'm having a lot of fun with these, as I always do. And they are coming out all wobbled to gidget. 
I don't know what that means. It just means when I look at the pictures in the show notes, I think the word wobbledy gidget, but they are coming out great. You can also tell from the picture on the left there, on the first of them, I am very close to the end of the foot. I'm probably a good almost four inches in, and I do five and three quarters for the feet before I go into the toe decreases. So these are really cranking along, but they always do. Now you may notice the yarn I'm using there for the foot. It's actually a whole skein. It's not a remnant. This is yarn from Premier Yarns that I bought at Joann's for like two bucks a skein. And the reason I'm using it is this is a cheaper yarn and I can make the feet because this thing comes in high, high yardage. It's like 230 yards a skein. So I can make the entire foot here and still have enough on that skein to make another entire sock. So I'm kind of anticipating its use as a spare yarn. However, it may never get to make a full sock because I have so many beautiful yarns to make a full sock out of. I may reserve this cheaper yarn to make the feet of my Franken socks and let myself use up the bits of my beautifully colored hand dyes for the legs. I'm having a whole industry, in other words, of Franken socks. I'm enjoying them so much and I crank on them so fast. So I'm thinking about just having Franken socks running in the background. However, the real advantage here is the Premier Serenity, whatever it's called, yarn is in stripes. I find when I work stripes, I go a lot faster because I use them as increments to measure how much I've knitted instead of putting in, you know, a stitch marker where I start to show how far I've come. So I'm debating just using up my inexpensive yarns as the feet on Franken socks or the feet on socks that where I make the leg from more expensive yarn that I have left over if I have enough left over to make a couple of legs. So it's an experiment in progress. I say this because I am sable on sock yarn. I have way more sock yarn than I think seriously that I can use in my remaining lifetime. And so why not? At this point, I can play any game I want to with my yarn. And that, my friends, is a really nice feeling. This, meanwhile, leads me to say that on the stash toss, we are still at four skeins in versus 27 skeins out. The socks, when I finish the spring is coming socks, that'll be one skein. When I finish the I need me some striped socks, unless I use up that skein of the Premier Serenity sock yarn, which I won't. I won't even come close. And by the way, I'm using two separate skeins of it, one for each leg, so that each skein will still have enough to make an entire sock, just in case, because I like me some stripey yarn. However, you don't count any skein out until you've completed the skein. The one exception I'm thinking of is with sock yarn, since I always have leftovers, no, I may consider a finished pair of socks equals a finished skein, or in some cases two skeins, and just throw the extras in my spare sock yarn bin to turn into Franken socks and heaven knows what else. I'm giving myself a little room to think about it, but the real question here is, am I getting the space back in my stash storage that a skein represents? And I would say in those cases, I am. Meanwhile, yes, there is a picture of the second Spring is Coming sock. It's not very far along in that picture. It's much farther now. You must be wondering about Vestuary 2023. There is a picture there of me wearing it with just the neck ribbing. The armhole ribbing is not in it. This was an interesting study because last night I finished the first armhole. So hopefully today I will get the second armhole done sometime or at least get it well started. The interesting thing here is if you look at that picture, you will see that the shoulder straps are very thin because the yarn in the armholes curls inward a lot. And when I put the first armhole in ribbing on last night, I did stand up and look at myself in the mirror. And it was amazing how much farther my right arm extended once it had ribbing. That, In other words, when you add the ribbing, you're uncurling the edge that curls under without ribbing and you're laying it out flat and that extends the width of the shoulder strap. Something to think of because I think we all have that moment when we make these things where we go, I could stop right here, I've got a finished edging or I could just put a row of finished edging on the armhole. Well, first of all, ribbing is so easy that once you pick up the stitches to put a row of finished edging, really why wouldn't you do the ribbing? 
But it's worth thinking about that that finished edge is stabilizing, but it's also pulling out, it's extending the width of the arm strap. So you get a bit more there. I have to admit, on Saturday, I simply wore it, even though it had no ribbing. I wore it because I wanted to wear it. It was a beautiful day, and I was wearing the pink skirt. I was wearing pretty much what you're seeing there, except I had on a turtleneck. And I just felt like wearing it, so I wore it. But that really showed me, wearing it all day, I really saw the difference that the ribbing makes. Strangely, no love on the don't know yet this week. It's been warm, but also I've just been focused on the socks which are very low bandwidth, like the don't know yet seeming is. And I've been focused on the vestuary. So hopefully I'll get back to the don't know yet. It's still cold enough here in the mornings where I could wrap it around my feet as I sew on it and be quite comfortable. So, you know, we are still working on attaching row 17 to the body of it. And then row 18 and row 19 are waiting their turns to be clipped on and attached. You'd think at this point, it's so close, I can taste it. You'd be right. But other things also were exciting this week. No love on the Pennsylvania Dutch embroidery, but I am preparing to embroider. I've got a few projects I want to do. No love on the Lady Eleanor. Meanwhile, my favorite resources are all listed there for you to enjoy. And they do include Birch and Cider to get those custom leather tags we all love. I have not yet added Raspberry Studios for the wonderful Chatelaine, so as I speak to you, I am typing it in with one finger. So there we go. It should be in the show notes. Dizzy Blondes, believe it or not, I have been spinning. I'm still working on the fuzzballs of Minerva, which is really easy because she's shedding. And I'm contemplating pulling out the silk that I want to blend it with and starting on that. This has all been done on drop spindle, on an extremely light drop spindle by Yorkie Slave, who no longer is making them as far as I can tell on Etsy. I also found, I have an old skein, I think I mentioned this, I have an old hank of a sort of junk fiber that I picked up at a yarn show years ago. And I've been spinning on that a little bit playfully because I'm just revving up my skills because I want to be able to demonstrate how you spin for my deaf culture class when I present my deaf artwork, so to speak. So I have been spinning a little bit. Nothing too big. I've got a Nano to unbox and I have not yet gotten to it. And that will be probably a summer project. It's just sitting forlornly here next to my electric eel. On to a strategy. This one, of course, is in honor of our blankets and also of the two wonderful companion cats whom Sage Pecos had to say goodbye to this week. And really, the strategy here is don't be a jerk when people are mourning a pet. That would really be what I'm trying to say. But you guys aren't jerks. However, it is surprising how in mainstream American culture we really minimalize the loss of pets. And I can remember reading a book when I was in high school that was about this. And it was written by a psychologist in like 1965. And the whole theme of the book was, wow, what a shock. People really miss their pets. I really cannot believe what that tells us about our culture and the disrespect for life and the ingratitude we often express casually towards our pets and our companions. However, I'm going to skip all that. And just say instead, let's use our common sense. First of all, what the word pet means is pretty hard to define. I would call blankets a pet, but blankets actually helped me run the ranch. Blankets actually was my security squad along with Baron when he was alive when I went running. Now, Eleanor, no good. Eleanor, when we were running, if somebody had attacked me, she would have sat down and looked for something to nibble on while she watched the show. But Blankets and Baron, and before them, Teddy, Tally, Artemis, Click, none of them were having any truck with a person approaching me without authorization from them. So what do you call that? Click was a major part of my getting over the loss of my father when I was 22 and suddenly found myself alone in the world. There were many lonely nights in Dad's home where he was dying and it was me and Click trying to get through it with our arms around each other. 
There is no way to measure what these companion animals do for us. There just is no way that I have learned more about life from my animals than from many other sources that might seem more appropriate. Tally, the Wonder Shepherd, taught me how to run. I was trying to learn to run a marathon, and I finally realized the one person I knew who could seemingly run endlessly was her. And so I started to watch how she ran, and what she taught me was taking rest breaks, getting in the shade, glugging up on water when you get the chance, and you think, why did a coach never teach me this? Coaches were always teaching me to get out there and hurt myself and overdo it and go until you drop and, you know, no pain, no gain. It was a German shepherd who taught me, pace yourself, take the rest breaks, even when they occur unexpectedly. I have completed three marathons and six or seven half marathons because my German shepherd taught me what to do. How do we measure these pets? They are service animals if you're blind, if you're in a wheelchair. They will help you find your way. They will pull your wheelchair. They will warn you if you're about to have a seizure. They will alert other people if you're in danger. There was the video that went viral about two years back of a German shepherd out in the woods in Alaska that found a sheriff's SUV and brought them to his master who was lying collapsed at the edge of the driveway. The guy would have frozen to death when the darkness came down if the German Shepherd hadn't located help and brought it to them. I can tell you dozens of stories like that from all my animals of the wonderful, intelligent, and humane things that they've done. I think my favorite would be my cat Guinevere, who when I was in graduate school at Stanford noticed that I had no food one night because I'd just run out of my grant and they sent it, they didn't send it on time, so I ran out of food. I was living paycheck to paycheck. And so I just said, well, it'll come tomorrow. And when I called Stanford, the response I got was literally, don't you have any friends who can help you get some food? That's what I got. They didn't do their job, but it was my fault for not being well socialized. Guinevere took things into her own paws and dragged a dead chicken carcass into my living room. It was a roasted chicken. Most of the meat was off it. It was covered in bugs. She dragged it into my living room through the backyard screen door laid it at my feet proudly, licked her chops, did not eat a bit of it, and offered it to me. And I think I've told this story before. If you know me, you know exactly what I did. Apart from the fact that I was trying not to gag, because the smell was unbelievable and those bugs weren't pretty, it's true. I put on kitchen gloves, I picked up that carcass, and I took it into my kitchen and closed the door so Guinevere couldn't come in. And then, yes, I made eating noises. And then I told her she was the best cat ever, and I carefully took the chicken out to the trash dumpster behind my apartments, and I came back in, and Guinevere was happy because she could smell chicken on me, so she thought I'd eaten it, apparently. I was careful not to let her smell my breath. How do you replace such a friend when they have to leave? The answer is you don't. That They're not just adorable, funny little things. If that was true, then when God forbid, a young child in our family dies, we wouldn't miss them anymore very much either because they were just cute and funny, right? And they took a lot of our time, right? So it's ridiculous, right? It's ridiculous. There's so much more going on. And I'm not going to try to compare the loss of a child to the loss of a pet because there are other things in play there, including human hardwiring, which I'm just fine with. But what I'm saying is, you can't simply reduce a pet to, well, they were cute and funny, but now they're gone. Gosh, I miss cute and funny. Because that would explain, sadly, other terribly tragic losses in our lives of people we liked who were cute and funny, but yet we miss them for years. You just can't do it that way. Instead, you have to realize that they are integrated into your life. They have a role in your life, and they respond to us. And they respond to us much as other humans do. They give us love and affection. In my case, they have saved my life. They have tried to feed me and care for me. They have been there when I was lonely and mourning. They have been something warm and fuzzy that I could hold. All those things are enough, but they do so much more. That, of course, all falls roughly into the category of emotional support animal. Why do we even have those? Because we acknowledge that people in problematic situations need comfort. But we also have therapy animals. Animals that are trained to perform certain functions, 
that may be life-saving in the case of their humans. How are you going to mourn that pet? Are you going to just say, oh, it was just a dog when your guide dog dies? I really doubt it. And then there's the symbolic value that when I lost my father, I felt without family. But when I lost blankets, I felt without, and this is going to sound strange, German shepherds. I felt without protection. I felt without safety. German shepherds, people react to them with uh, hesitation and caution. That's a very good thing. I've had them for 20 years since we moved to the farm. So now the farm is in a new stage without the German shepherds, but also without the llamas, realizing that we're in a kind of shutting down stage as we consider the next phase of our life. So the animals represent the loss of a phase of our lives. And I think if you look at the amount of time that some animals get with us, that's really significant. I had blankets for 13 years. Well, that's, what, 20% of my life? I mean, that's huge. I only had my father for 22. You know, that's most of my, my grandparents and my aunts and uncles, I had even fewer. They do represent a significant era in our lives, and it should be respected. And so that's what I really want to say. If you're mourning a pet, I would tell you, try to ignore the naysayers who say, oh, it was only a cat or it was only a llama or only a dog. They are so much more to us. Humans, while we may verbally make these distinctions between human and animal and pet and service animal or whatever, our hearts and souls are just not that precise. There is a gap in our lives, and it's a huge gap, and you have the right to mourn it. And that means you mourn it the way you would mourn anything else. You make a gravestone, you bury it in a grave, or you do ceremonies over it, whatever makes you feel good. Ironically, when the great Guinevere passed, <laughs> my first long-distance cat, uh, I had a, a, two cats before her who died tragically young, but Gwen went the distance for 17 years before a heart murmur took her out as a heart attack. Actually, I think it was congenital heart failure more than a heart attack. But anyway, Guinevere was a huge personality. She was part Persian in her background and all Persian in her personality. When Guinevere died, I had a little gravestone made for her. And it's sitting in my living room because I can't bear to take it out of the house. That like Guinevere is still with us in the house. Weirdly, we got blankets, ashes back. I can't bear to look at them. So I believe my beloved has taken them into the back 40 and buried them quietly. For some reason, I can look at the reminder of Guinevere. But I simply can't look at the reminders of my German shepherds. I have no way to understand that. All I can tell you is when we talk about leaving the farm, with retirement, and I don't know when that'll happen, frankly, or if it'll happen, but one of the things that troubles me is I feel like I'll be leaving so many of my friends who are here in our back 40 acreage resting quietly, you know, with us on the place that they loved. Mourning for pets can go on just as long as mourning for anybody else, and we have to respect it that way, and that means when someone else is mourning a pet, we have to respect it. I have a friend in New Jersey who lost her collies, these two really wonderful dogs, now, like five years ago, four years ago, for both of them. And she still gets all emotionally worked up about them. And part of me goes, wow, girlfriend, you need to kind of move on. You have new dogs. And then I realize I'm doing the same thing. I just don't talk about it. She's just more open about it. You're allowed to mourn your pets. You're allowed to mourn them the way you mourn other humans. What I would suggest, don't compare it. Just don't. Don't say, well, you're mourning that pet more than you mourned great uncle David. You know, don't do that. It just isn't comparable. The relationships are simply not that simple. And they're not that uncomplicated. You simply can't tell how you're going to mourn and anything. I mean, there, there are levels of mourning that are not about beings that we mourn. I mourn the days when as a child I walked the woods alone with a 35 pound dog and felt completely safe. How do you how do you register that level of mourning that my son would not feel able to do the same thing or that my daughter certainly wouldn't if I had a daughter? How do you mourn these things? Mourning is simply not that. Mourning is not a comparative scale. Mourn your pets. Cry all you need to. 
Get it out of your system as much as you can and recognize that you may be mourning for a long time. I realized the other day that Fearless has been gone for five years and I still miss her every day. You know, Baron has been gone for, I think, four, three or four. Eleanor has been gone for one. And I miss them and I always will. And I don't think you want to get into the comparative mourning game. If someone is mourning their pet, you simply understand they're mourning a deep loss. You don't have to compare it to anything else. And if you are mourning a pet as I am, and Sage Pecos is, you know, do what you do to handle your sadness. You go back to my, my outside problem. This is the emotion skill from Accepts, the acronym. My external problem is blankets is gone. My internal problem is my sadness. I can't deal with blankets being gone until I manage my sadness. That doesn't make me love her any the less just because I'm taking care of myself and trying to reduce my painful feelings. In fact, it's a tribute to one of the lessons that Blankets taught me to just keep going. It is not a lack of mourning if I continue and I can be happy. On to the fluffy books. I have none. <laughs> well, I really don't. I'm finally done with The Introduction to American Deaf Culture by Thomas Holbrook. I have another book by Holbrook and his father and his brother about anecdotes of deafness and it's had several different titles and I can't remember which version I bought and I will move on to it but currently I'm just occasionally browsing the Lynn Messina series about Beatrice Hyde Clare. I'm trying to finish book nine of the Beatrice Hyde Clare and I'm looking at book two of the Verity Lark series but I'm not really reading right now because I've been working my butt off for ASL class and I'll come back to it. Something I really like, I really recommend, if you're interested in the Chatelaines, you go look at the picture there. I have been prepping myself to work on embroidery. Now, in terms of a Chatelaine, embroidery, what you're going to carry on a Chatelaine, is probably going to be a needle threader, embroidery scissors with very, very sharp points. There are companies that will make a combined needle keeper and yarn threader, but I could not find what I liked on Etsy. So I decided instead to get the cat with the butcher knife in its mouth. Yes, that's me. I'll show you the picture when it comes as my needle keeper for my upcoming embroidery. And the nice thing about that is I will probably be able to attach it to the Chatelaine simply because it has a strong magnet. But we will see how that works out. And also I have the little tall bags that I can attach to the Chatelaine and put the needle keeper in it when it's not on an embroidery. So that will be Chatelaine ready. But finding a needle threader that was Chatelaine ready was more of a challenge. Finally, I found Clover has one. And there it is. And it costs, I think with the mailing cost was like 10 bucks. But I like it. It is green, so it is not hideous or weird looking. It has its own little plastic case attached to it. And the case has a keyhole in the top, a little hole for a keychain, I should say. So I have attached it to a spare chain I had from my watch, I believe, from my little mini watch for my Chatelaine. So there it is, Chatelaine ready. It is not on the Chatelaine yet. I do have a special basket in our bedroom suite where I keep the Chatelaines and all their accoutrements, except my scissors on a Chatelaine I'm looking at right now. I got those really cheap on Amazon. If you go back through previous episodes, you'll probably find the link. But frankly, if I were you, go to Amazon and just search embroidery scissors necklace and you'll probably come up with it. All right. But there and something I really like, there is my beautiful little needle threader that I'll be using for my embroidery. And it is on a very pretty Chatelaine hook. Meanwhile, in the tea tastings, this is put a lid on it, in other words, I tried a new one. This is Good Morning Moringa Herbal Tea. I have no idea what Moringa is. I should look it up. This is a rooibos tea, so it is an herbal with the flavor somewhat of a black tea. In this case, no. In this case, no. It doesn't really have that flavor. But it has rooibos, moringa leaves, date pieces, Sugar people, pay attention to that. That might be a little sweet. Lemon peel, tangerine pieces. Again, a little bit of natural sweetness there. 
yuzu pieces, lemongrass, and lemon essence. I have no idea what Moringa is and how it tastes. Everybody feel free to write in or probably I'll Google it. Date pieces, that really surprised me, so that's going to sweeten it. And then the tangerine pieces. Again, that's really interesting. I would assume, I don't know if they, they don't say peel, they say lemon peel above it. So it's not just tangerine peel. It's an interesting thing to add. Again, I think they're trying to give sweetness. I'm not sure what yuzu does. What you get out of this? I thought it's a rooibos, so this will be a really good hot tea. Actually, when you drink it, it's got that lemongrass flavor. That's what comes across the most. But it's very watered down, the lemongrass. I really can't describe the flavor well because I'm probably tasting things I don't recognize, like moringa or yuzu. However, this has that slightly tangy feel that makes me say, okay, make that into an iced tea. So even as we speak, I have it in a tea diffuser in a pint jar in my kitchen becoming iced tea. I also have to say, one of the things I've started doing is going to Trader Joe's and buying Trader Joe's house brand of sparkling water because it's all natural. It has no sweeteners. It's safe for diabetics. Zero carbs. I have been adding that to my iced teas and I've been trying different flavors. Surprisingly, the black cherry works very well with almost everything. I think because it gives it that hint of sweetness without making it sugary. At any rate, so the Good Morning Moringa Herbal Tea, it's kind of bland as a hot tea, but I think it's going to really sparkle as an iced tea. And I'm going to be mixing it with lemon flavored sparkling water from Trader Joe's. And I'm thinking that's going to really enhance the lemon flavor. If you're going to drink this as a hot tea, I would say a touch of sweetener would be a very good idea. I'd be careful because I think this has a lot of natural sweetener. So I think if you're using anything like stevia, that's going to go bitter on you, but it might be worth trying it. But this has certainly got promise as an iced tea. And this is a Plum Deluxe tea, by the way. On to the blather. Well, in deaf culture class, she's just pouring on the assignments. Thank goodness we had to do an article summary, and we've known that since the beginning. And fortunately, I did that in about the third week of class, and I'm really grateful because we have a quiz on three chapters of the textbook. We have two written assignments. They're all due a week from yesterday. And we've got a huge amount of readings and we still have to attend deaf events and all that. So this has been kind of wackadoodle class and she's just piling up stuff. But I'm getting through it and I am enjoying it. And I'm glad I'm getting it done with because everybody in the deaf studies program is supposed to take it. I would tell you, when they advertise these classes, they say you don't need ASL. Let me tell you that having a smattering of ASL has helped, but really doing ASL would be even better because the teacher is deaf and it would be nice to follow her signing better than I do. But also there are just moments where signing happens and I've been a little left out as a hearing person. That is not necessarily a bad thing. It does make me realize how deaf people feel when they're hanging out with hearing people, which is a large part of their time. But anyway, if you're going to max this out, it might be better to have more ASL than I have. There is no ASL I can attend this summer, which means effectively I'm going back to zero next fall, but they won't let me take the ASL 101 class over again. So I'm probably going to look at another local community college for their ASL 101, or I'm going to look at something online that is out there being taught by deaf people. So we'll see how that goes. On the pup date, everybody is doing great. Queenie lost her collar. The vet took it away and said it was too tight for her, which was fine by me. I wasn't present, so I didn't have to be embarrassed. I had just loosened it a few days before, and then she floofed, is all I can say. So we got her a new giant collar because she's got this huge collie ruff. She has now grown into her full coat and her full ruff. She is a smaller dog than Eleanor. She does not have the impressive bulk. Eleanor was a big girl. She would even have been a big boy. Collie males are typically larger than collie females. Queenie is very much a typical collie female in terms of size, but in terms of bulk, she's very, very thick set and full. She's got a real herding dog build and she's got all the instincts. So if I can ever get her to obey me, which is a big if, Queenie is 
completely like Eleanor, completely stubborn and independent. And I think she is all the best that a herding dog can be. I suspect I've got a real winner there. And I hope I get a chance to try that with her. But to do that, I have to have her be able to come on a recall. Queenie's very like a Norwegian elk hound, like my late beloved Click. She does what she thinks she should do. She's got some opinions. Anyway, so I put the new collar on her. And we had this hilarious hour of the new collar dance where I put it on her and it was very loose. And so I began tightening it on her and she began dancing with me or without me, whether I had my hands on her or not. So she now has her new bright, shiny, it's not quite neon orange. It's like a rose gold because I really want her collar to show. I want her to look as though she is possessed and loved by a family. But they're doing fine. Captain has grown into the senior dog. She has moved into that space where she understands she sleeps with us at night and she is the obedient one and she is very close to us, but she overheats. She's got the big newfie coat on the border collie sized body, slightly larger than a border collie, but smaller than a newf. And so she's always hot. So Captain is one to sleep outside at night these days because she simply overheats in the house no matter what we're doing. The hub state. He and the beloved son are doing very well. The beloved son is finishing his spring break this week. They have been working hard all week long to catch my son up. My hubs is pretty much his aid in school for a large part of the day because it keeps my son from distracting and doing other things. And unlike other kids his age who would probably be embarrassed by having their father at the school, my kid loves it. He just loves working with his dad. This is one of those situations where homeschooling might have been a really good idea, but we didn't have the skills for that and we didn't quite have the time. So this has worked out pretty well. My hubs is still able to do his contract writing, but he's spending a lot of the day working with our son. Do we have any regrets? None whatsoever. None whatsoever. If this is what it takes to make my child happy in school, I'm happy to be the major wage earner and I'm happy to have the hubs doing this. Our lives could be easier and our, <laughs> our bills could be lower, but this works great for us. And I'm so fortunate that I can work from home at a time like this. And by the way, it has been a taxing week. My poor hubs, he does our taxes. He has been just heroic this week, getting them finished. And I have learned a few tricks about making the transfer of information more smooth. I collect all the receipts I can scan and all the important stuff that comes to me, like W-2 forms and whatnot, I collect them on my Remarkable. So they're offline on my Remarkable in PDF form. And then once a year, I spend hours transferring them. I have now learned a much more efficient process of keeping a separate flash drive. And so everything goes on to the Remarkable, but the Remarkable can easily transfer through the computer into the flash drive, through my PC into the flash drive. This has been very, very helpful. So the new lesson is once a month, any tax documents that have come are gonna go from the Remarkable into the flash drive, and then the flash drive just goes to the hubs. So there's a new trick for time management, that instead of getting frustrated that my poor husband has been working really hard and he kind of got down to the last minute with the taxes, and instead of getting frustrated with that, I have to realize he's been working really hard and that my having to give a lot of time at the end of the process could have been avoided if I'd done a little better time management and just been carefully transferring these documents every so often in small bits to a flash drive so it can be ready to give to him. Again, so many problems that we have in our relationships can be solved by a reasonable use of technology. That's what it's there for. On the calendar, nothing. <laughs> the Evolution of Psychotherapy Conference in Anaheim, December 12th through 17th. The boys and I have been tentatively talking about an escape to Mammoth when the snowpack reduces and we can get in there without a four-wheel drive. And that shouldn't be too long up the road, actually, because they keep those roads pretty clear because they will have a ski season into July or August this year. And Minerva gets the last word. That's a one in a million picture. She's actually yawning, but she looks like she's screaming at someone in profile. And so I think Minerva would tell you, let your voice be heard. Say what you need to say. 
Let people know what's on your mind. Do it in a respectable way. But learn how to let your voice be heard. And we have been enjoying that this week with her because she's really talking to all of us. She's really settled into her sixth year on this planet. Her birthday just went by. And she has discovered that she doesn't have to bite and claw and all that. She very rarely does that. She also gets confused what's a love bite and what is just a little too hard. But she's working very hard on communicating with us and the importance of doing that, of realizing we can reasonably communicate with this little fuzzy being in our life has been good for all of us. So you'll see my son at the top of the notes petting Minerva and at the bottom you will see her expressing herself to me. I'm kind of frowning a little bit because I'm focused on her and I'm trying to take her picture. But there you go. Minerva's last word, let your voice be heard. In the meantime, let's not forget we are a community, and as a community, we will be safer and more healthy than if we try to do everything individualistically. So that means we still have illnesses in our community. We still have immune-compromised people in our community. So you know what I'm going to say, right? Wear your mask when you need to. Wash your hands. Socially distance when you need to. Get your vaccines. In other words, everybody... Stay safe, take care of each other, and I will talk to you soon. Bye-bye. So we have come to the end of another episode of Cognitive. Please do not use this podcast to diagnose yourself. If you think you are having a mental health problem, please contact a licensed mental health professional. Show notes for these episodes can be found at cognitivepodcast, all one word, Dot blogspot.com. Episodes can be found at iTunes under the name Cognitive Podcast, but also can be found posted next to the show notes on the Blogspot page. Thank you so much for listening. Everybody stay safe, take care of each other, and I'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.